All right, so originally I was supposed to do horse colic, but I work in the Purdue Small Animal Hospital, and I saw so many cases of parvo come in that I decided that I wanted to talk about this instead. So how many people in here have dogs? How many people know what parvo is? Okay, so for those of you who don't know what parvo is, it's a common disease in dogs, especially puppies, and basically it's just a highly contagious viral disease, but it can lead to death of the dog. And so we have a lot of these cases coming in, and I wanted to inform you guys what it is, especially because people who have dogs and don't know what it is, I feel like it's important to know. So there's two types, which I didn't know. I thought there was only the intestinal form, but there's also a cardiac form. And basically what it is is the cardiac form attacks the um, muscle uh, tissue, and it can cause myocardia or death um, if it does too much damage. But I'm going to focus on the intestinal form because we are on gastroenterology. Um, so basically, it's a virus that is highly per persistent and resistant to many things. So whenever um, it's released outdoors, it can last for two months outdoors if you don't do anything about it, which is why it's so likely for puppies to get it if they're not vaccinated. Um, and it's resistant to many um, disinfectants, which is why basically in vet offices you either buy a, a brand name that is known for disinfecting it or you use bleach. Um, but it's really hard to get rid of once you have it. And then there's two different forms. There's 2B, which is the well-known one, um, but in 2006, um, 2C started to show up, and so now we're vaccinated for that as well. But basically what happens is it, it replicates in the lymphoid tissue, um, and then it spreads through the blood, which I'll get more into that in just a second. Um, and then basically the damage that it does is it destroys the lining, um, and then it makes it hard for them to absorb nutrients, which is why one of the signs is dehydration. But I'll give you guys a second to write that down. Okay, so this is just kind of a little chart that I made of the process. So basically they look for um, cells that are rapidly dividing so that they can spread fast. Um, so they choose a lymphocyte, and basically they um, invade the lymphocyte and then begin replicating. And then once they replicate enough, they um, jump to the leukocyte, and basically it ends up killing a bunch of leukocytes, and so you have issues with white blood cell counts, um, which is why for diagnosis they look at the CBC, but I'll talk about that later. Um, and then once they're on the leukocytes, they use it for transportation, and what this does is it allows them to basically hide from the body because they're looked at as a leukocyte and not as a foreign body. And so it allows them to travel through the blood without being attacked. And then basically it goes to the small intestine and it starts to destroy the wall or the, it goes to the bone, bar bone marrow. So you can see here that it can either go to the epithelium. Okay. So it goes to the epithelium or the crypts. And basically the crypts is where um, if anything happens to the epithelium, which is like the tissue, um, and the crypts is where it replicates to rebuild the tissue. And so it attacks both so that the replication isn't um, able to repair. And then it can also um, go to the bone marrow. So contraction, the main one is from dog to dog. So basically if there's fecal matter in a park um, or you meet a new dog and they're sniffing each other, it can um, transfer more than just through fecal matter. It can transfer through the saliva or um, through their, like, uh, from their eyes, which doesn't happen as often. And then people. This is very important. If you work in a vet office, make sure you clean up if you do like a parvo during the day. Make sure you're not taking it home with you. Um, for people who, um, just at home, if your dog gets parvo, make sure that you clean up at home and clean yourself before you leave the house so that you're not transferring it to other dogs in public. And then persistence. So they do last even after the dog is treated. It will still go through the dog's body into the fecal matter after um, 10 days after they're treated. So just keep an eye on it. You, after they're treated, still go a couple weeks of cleaning up after them so that you know you're not spreading it, especially if you have multiple dogs or if you have other dogs come over to your house. But basically, once it goes through the body, it, it, once they contract it, it's about four to five days before it does start showing up. So most susceptible, so basically puppies are the most susceptible to this. Um, but especially six weeks to six months. And it's worse whenever they're not vaccinated or incompletely vaccinated. And I've heard this a lot when people come into the vet office that they get it, like their vaccines are like Royal King or something like that. 
all of those are vaccines. They're probably not as reliable, and so we like to revaccinate, or even if your breeder vaccinates them, we still suggest revaccinating them because we don't know that they stored them right, we don't know that they gave them right, and we just want to make sure that they don't end up with parvo because it's very likely. But there are specific breeds that are more susceptible, so Rotties, Pit Bulls, Labs, Doberman Pinschers, German Shepherds, uh, English Spanier, Spaniels, and Alaskan Sled Dogs. So I just wanted to include my puppies in here because I thought they were cute. So signs, the most ones that people know are vomiting and diarrhea. When we have hear someone call in saying their dog is vomiting and diarrhea, we automatically say it's parvo and make sure that we um, put protective gear on before we grab them. Um, another sign is lethargy, um, dehydration, anorexia, severe weight loss, and fever. And basically all of these are just because they're unable to absorb that nutrients in water because of the destruction of the intestine wall. So I'll let you guys write those down. So diagnosis, the main one is the one up here that you see on the top. And basically what it is, is it's just a rectal swab. So we'll take it, open it, swab the rectal area. And then basically what you do is just put it back together. You snap that top part, which is, um, it just opens it up and allows you to push the um, solution into there. Um, and that's just a snap test, kind of like heartworm snap test, if you guys know what that is. And then chemistry panel, basically you're just looking at the white blood cell count. Um, if it's low, then that's a concern. CBC also allows you to look at what's in the blood. Um, PCR is something a little different that I didn't know about, and basically it just is like a fecal test, and it allows you to look, um, there's certain um, a DNA that shows up, like a single strand of DNA that shows up in this test that allows you to see if they have um, parvo, and then electron microscopy, which is just right here, microscopy that you can just see um, parvo in the, under the microscope. Treatment, so, you can do fluids, um, electrolytes, antibiotics. So basically, the only reason you'd give antibiotics is because you'd be afraid of that um, secondary bacterial infection. And the reason that would happen is because you have a low white blood cell count, which means you don't have those neutrophils fighting off um, disease. So then you would have the idea of getting a secondary bacterial infection. Um, then you have antiemetics, which basically that's trying to keep your dog from vomiting. Um, because if you're giving anything orally, they're going to end up throwing it up. So you want to keep that vomiting down. And then maropitin is basically one of the well-known ones that is good to give well, if they have parvo. And serenia is one of the well-known ones. Um, that's what we used in our vet office. That's the one that I've heard from other vet offices. So that's just one of the ones that is well-known. Prevention. So main thing, get your dog vaccinated. Um, there's a schedule here. You can start around six to eight weeks when you start vaccinating. Depends on the vet office of where you go. Um, but get distemper, and then there's other vaccines, but every vet is different on their schedules. So PPE is basically personal protective gear. So if you work in a vet office, make sure you put that on if you think there's a possible parvo case so that you don't spread it to other dogs. Isolation, so in, either in the vet office or at home, make sure you're keeping them separated from other animals. And if you do have them together, just make sure that you, the other one is vaccinated. Um, and then frequent cleaning. So like I said, it is very resistant to other cleaners. So don't just try using Lysol or something. Make sure you're using bleach. Even if it is diluted bleach, still use something that is potent. And then foot baths. So you can do this at home, but it's mostly for people who work in a vet office just to make sure that you're not spreading it everywhere. And then there are different vaccines. It's not, it just basically, this one is hepatitis. This one is adenovirus, but it doesn't do the second one. This one includes both one and two. Um, those don't really matter for my presentation, but I just figured I'd show the different ones that they have. Um, but make sure you're cleaning both inside and outside, not just if you have them inside, that's fine. But if they're going outside and using the restroom, make sure you pick up their fecal matter. You don't want to spread it to other dogs. Also, if you have like wildlife, like foxes and stuff, you can pick up their fecal matter that's in your yard because it can spread through them as well. It's not just in dogs. And there's my sources. Okay, questions, questions, comments, I'll let you point. Yes. Yeah. Okay, so basically they just want something that can replicate easily that's gonna basically rapidly dividing cells. So they choose lymphocytes and basically it's just so that they can divide rapidly and spread throughout the body really fast. 
and then they choose leukocytes because they're going to go undetected and because it takes them straight to the bloodstream. And then once they're in the bloodstream, they go to the small intestine. And then once they're in the small intestine, there's two different things they can do. They can go to the epithelium in the crypts, or they can go to the bone marrow. So the main thing is that they go to the epithelium and basically start destroying that wall and that tissue. And then they go to the crypts to prevent it from rebuilding. And so basically, if they can't replenish that wall, it's going to destroy it. And that can lead to secondary bacterial infection. Go back one slide, too, because in, in the two, I thought there was maybe one more back. There's one where you had, there, that, right there. There's the light side. Oh, sorry. Yeah. <coughs> Explain that one a little bit. So basically, this is just the, through the fecal matter of how it can transfer. So basically, if a dog's a carrier, he would use the bathroom anywhere, honestly. And then if a dog smells it or ends up eating it, then he'll get, or he can, um, it can go through nasal that he can get it, or if he eats it, he can get it. But basically, then it goes to multiply, like I showed in the last um, image. And then if you treat it, it could be successful. It could not be, depending on how severe it is by the time you take him into the vet office. Um, but if you don't treat it all, it is likely that your dog will die because of damage to that intestinal wall. Yeah, it's not as common, especially because most older dogs are vaccinated for it, but I don't know, like, exact stats, but as far as, like, I've worked in a vet office for, like, the past three years, and I've n never seen an older dog come in with Parvo, so I'm assuming it's not that likely. So, yeah, um, okay, so she asked if a vaccinated dog could become a carrier. So I'm going to say yes, because if he's vaccinated and ends up with Parvo, are you saying he's vaccinated after or before? Okay, so if he's vaccinated before and he gets it, I'm assuming that he would be a carry at that point because he does have it. Um, as far as if he was vaccinated afterwards, I don't know how that would work. So I don't think he would do that. Okay. I'll just make a few comments, yeah, because uh, there's things that you can do that are practical. Like, I always love to travel with my dogs, okay? And when they're puppies, do you know when you pull off to one of those, uh, on the interstate, they have the rest areas? And when it says, pet walking area that way, I never take my dogs that way. Because I'm the sign to me says, parasites and viruses this way. I'll stop at a Walmart and go to a corner where no one ever goes. You know those big parking lots? And there's a lot of people parked here, but I'm parked over there and I'm walking my dogs. So that's something practical you can do, especially young puppies. You know, take, don't take them where everybody else goes. <clears throat> and I also know that some vet clinics, if you come in with a parvovirus case, you don't come in at all. They put their PPE on and come out and get the sample from your car, the dog in your car. Well, I take that susceptible dog into the vet clinic. Some have separate doors but the best one and I have a good friend a student of mine who uh, we're still working together but anyway Noah they go out to the car and get the samples and then run the tests so they keep the and this is especially puppies right outside so I like that idea don't bring it in because does anybody know <clears throat> and this is great because I'm a, a partner with these guys and I can't remember if I mentioned a week or two ago, what it's, what's it called when you pick up a disease at a vet hospital or a hospital? Do you remember that? Because they're, they're, uh, all the bugs in a vet hospital or a regular hospital is resistant to all the disinfectants they use, if, right? If there's a bug surviving in that kind of environment, it's pretty much a super bug. Iatrogenic, uh, no, that's the disease you get from the treatment, okay? So let's, let's do those, let me spell that out for you because, and then Kristen's going to come up here. Kristen, come up here while, you're, while I'm doing this. Iatrogenic, there it is. <clears throat> this is when, uh, when treatment results in a bad thing. The word I was looking for was nosocomal, so I'm not sure if I've done that before. Nose, nosocomal, right there. 
Look at that, originating in the hospital. So look at all these beautiful terms. Find your thing, Kristen. 